Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel and to Curious Business Talks, the place where I interview professionals and get to know them a little bit on a personal and professional level. Today we have Elizabeth and she's saying hi from Thailand, I think, and I'm just going to hand over the mic to her so she can introduce herself and tell us where she's saying hi from. <laughs> hi, I'm Elizabeth. Hi, uh, nice to talk to you, Nicoletta. Um, I'm currently in Thailand, so my mom is from here. I'm a digital nomad, and it's probably the place where I'm spending most of my time off, uh, most of my time in. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm a freelance UX designer. I have been freelancing for four years, doing UX for seven years, and have been a nomad in since two years. Wow, okay. Um, you said you are mainly in Thailand. Does it mean that you are like born on an island and you are like no foreign to this life or you grow up somewhere else? I grew up in Austria. Um, I pretty much grew up in a small town, stayed uh -huh. there, went to school there. And I moved out of Austria when I was 25, mm -hmm. studied in the UK, then moved to London and then got stuck abroad during COVID and then moved back to London and figured I don't want to spend another winter lockdown there. And that's when I started nomading. Uh, okay. So would you say that you started nomading just because you wanted to see more or you just wanted to, um, I don't know, maybe go back to your roots, whatever that means? I really like to travel. And mm -hmm. I like to slow travel. So mm -hmm. stay in one place for one, two months, really get to know places, not having to depend on Google Maps all the time to find your way home. And you just need to spend more time in a place. And also, especially when you're working at the same time, mm -hmm. you don't get to see everything. You know, when you're on holiday for a week, you can go to so many different places. But if you work, you have the weekends or every other day. So yeah, I... I always wanted to do it, mm -hmm. but I was always too scared to do this. What if I can't find clients where I can work remote, these kind of things. But COVID helped with that. So mm -hmm. all the clients I've had, none of them really asked me to come to the office. And yeah, so I just said, am I allowed to swear? I just yeah, said, Fuck it. <laughs> it's not made for kids. So I think we are allowed okay, after cool. one minute or so. so. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just thought I'll... I always wanted to do it. Why don't I do it now? And then, yeah, just did it. So it was perfect timing with the pandemic to just launch that uh, experience for yourself. Um, yes and no, mm -hmm. because at the beginning, we all didn't know how long it was going to take. Exactly. And I was, um, actually, I was in Colanta where I am now, and I only just realized this was the place where it all happened. <laughs> okay. And yeah, and my parents are, um staying in Austria my sister as well and mm -hmm. the four of us were on holiday here and the Austrian government notified all the people that were abroad to come back home mm -hmm. UK government where I lived at the time of course didn't do anything mm -hmm. so I just stayed and then there were no more flights black and then I was lucky that I could stay with my aunt in Bangkok mm -hmm. and I started a little YouTube channel for her I did a cooking channel with her oh, which was God. fun yeah <laughs> um yeah, it's in Thai though, <laughs> which was a big learning curve because I learned so many new words, very food related, but still very useful. And yeah, and then it was two months in and I got the first flight back from Bangkok to Austria. Mm -hmm. And then eventually when once I figured this is going to take longer than a couple weeks or months, we all thought, yeah. I decided to go back to London. And then I figured, like I spent one winter lockdown there. Mm -hmm. And then when they announced the next winter lockdown, I was like, why am I doing this? I don't have any reason really to be here. So I sold everything and mm -hmm. traveled. Yeah. Nice. It sounds almost one of those, uh, you know, movies and uh, stories that you see on the TV, right? Uh, they sold everything and they moved the country. And I mean, what? Well, it is your story so it is your movie that you're writing so it sounds quite <laughs> exciting um on, on the, that note uh, can you tell us a little bit about um how how did you end up in UX were you always in design or was it some kind of uh, transition how how it happened for you it happened completely by accident mm -hmm. so when I was in Austria I actually went to film school and okay. like I wanted to edit 
and maybe one day produce my own movie. And then um, I moved to, no, actually the school was really bad. It took the fun out of film for, for me. Mm -hmm. And I had two part-time jobs at that time to pay for film school. And my dad was just like, before you don't do anything, just go full time. And then I was there for a while and got really sick of it. Like mm -hmm. I, I lost like two, three years. I didn't lose my life in that time, you know, but um, it was kind of wasted years. I didn't learn anything. Every day was the same. Mm -hmm. And then I found an advert for advertising school and I applied. I got in and they had a partnership with a school. You can all shorten it down. I feel like I give you the very long version. But basically, I moved to the UK um, trying to do advertising. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a copywriter, which mm -hmm. is difficult as a non-native speaker. And in England, you always have to team up with a designer. So they okay. kind of hire people in teams. At mm -hmm. least that's what they told us back then at university. And yeah, I couldn't um, find a copywriting internship, but I found a internship where you do a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And I did marketing, I did copywriting, I did design, and I did UX, not knowing that I did UX. Mm -hmm. And then I went to some networking event or something, and this person asked me what I was doing. And then I told them, and they were like, oh, so you do UX design? And I was like, I don't know what sure. that is. And then that <laughs> evening I went home, Googled UX, and yeah. I realized it's all the stuff that I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. um, so it was user research, analyzing data, um, like designing the screens and everything. And I was like, Putting things ah, together. that's a job. And mm -hmm. yeah, and then I just applied for UX gigs mm -hmm. and got a full-time UX job. So it was completely by accident. I didn't even know what UX was. Okay, amazing. So you're doing it before you actually sign up to do it, right? Yes, but that was seven years ago. So I think mm -hmm. now companies have heard what UX is. They know yeah. what kind of different areas there are in UX and yeah or they pretend they know <laughs> <laughs> well um, fake it till you make it yeah both sides the companies that hire yeah. in the designers as well um for those of you who don't know you or any of your work can you tell us a bit about your projects and what you have worked on what is your experience like from this past seven years in UX what have are like what are most of the interesting projects that you have been on and you're like oh I I am so glad I got in UX because of this a lot of projects which I really enjoyed mainly because of the teams that I worked with and mm -hmm. it was just so nice to also see everyone get excited about the end result mm -hmm. mm, but I think my favorite project still is probably one of my earliest projects which was an app for a pharmacy and mm -hmm. what they did it's called pillow but they I think they didn't implement the app in the end because they got enough sales through the website. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's been probably five, six years or something yeah. since I did that. But um, it's basically an app where people that have long-term illnesses like diabetes, cancer, who always need the same medication to make their life a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to go to the doctors, get a prescription, then go to the pharmacy, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then having to sit at home and put it in your Monday to Sunday box manually and yeah. then you also have human error that maybe you put the wrong dosage or wrong pill so they automated all of that wow. and it's an app where it tracks with the yeah so it was a really great product which it was yeah. also why it's fun working for and it was by two young guys in Manchester mm -hmm. and um, yeah it was just super nice team they were super excited about it and we had almost free range on the project so and they were also very keen on accessibility, especially because of the target audience, because it can be older people, etc. So that was a really good project to work on. Oh, it sounds so so like uh, interesting to to hear about this because I really imagine UX being exactly that, doing projects that really have some kind of tangible impact and you can hear or see afterwards because most of the projects that when we do freelance we never know if we're going to see day of light or is it going to be shipped are we going to actually use it on our phones or whatnot so it, it's really nice that you had that opportunity to, to actually push through and see it out on Instagram stories, I always see you tuning in from different locations. And I just wonder, do you have any kind of map or a treasure journey journal or anything where you put your locations? You're like, 
in this location, I will do this, and this location, I will do, experience that. Do you have something like that to track your travels? Or something well, digital? Well, I put a lot of, yeah, I, I do use Notion because mm -hmm. I have so many flights and so many things where I don't, where, for example, I know I have to be there because there's a friend's wedding, so I have to be in France end of August. But then, did I book the flight yet? Or did I book accommodation yet? So I have a whole notion just for flights and another notion just for accommodation. And I guess if you just go on Google, you can see all the little pins mm -hmm. where I've been. Mm -hmm. Or if I see some person post somewhere where I'm not, uh, about a place where I'm going to go, I always save it mm -hmm. if it's good. Yeah. And yeah, so I guess you can track there where I've been. But also a friend of mine has this app called MapMelon. And there you can put in recommendations and things like that. And I keep mm -hmm. forgetting about tracking everything. And it's really, really good for digital nomads because you can also type in where you're going to go in the future. Mm -hmm. So you can see with your friends, for example, if I don't know where I'm going to go in July, I can see yeah. where my friends are going. And then I can be like, oh, I'll, I'll just join you. So... That's this, also a good way to track it. So awesome. You have to leave me uh, the name of the app later on so I can yes, find yes. it as well. I need, I, I mean, we can have a separate chat, how to travel solo. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do that chat with you, of course, because I also want to travel more uh, maybe this year or the end of the year, maybe next year, like more seriously, you know, we pack everything and go. But for now, I'm going to just do it one trip at a time. Um, mm -hmm. Which country... Uh, taught you the most like smart uh, street smart or like business smart lessons which country gave you like oh my god I really have to learn this time this lesson well it's not really country specific mm -hmm. but when I started traveling I just made too many plans because so many people tell you oh in this place you have to book so far in advance because mm -hmm. especially when I stay somewhere for two months I don't mm -hmm. want to move around within that city I don't want to pack my suitcase and unpack 10 times mm -hmm. so to find a place where you can stay for two months on the right dates you have to book it a couple of months in advance and what I learned is that you have to be more spontaneous and it's a very difficult balance to find how spontaneous you want to be and how much you want to plan in advance mm -hmm. because sometimes if you just get a random taxi at the airport it can be cheaper compared to when you book it or the other way around so yeah. it's always there is no rule in all the countries you know mm -hmm. um and I wouldn't say that was something I learned in one specific country or city mm -hmm. but general just be prepared that not everything goes to plan mm -hmm. like have the open-mindedness to be like okay yes. f it I'm going to leave it as it is <laughs> I'm yeah. going with the flow mm -hmm. yeah but also plan in advance because there are some places where you can't pay by card always have cash for example or maybe you don't have internet there so mm. yeah so it's it's things like that where you have to check is it good enough to go there especially if you're a nomad you have to make sure you can work from there mm -hmm. and also I learned that you can trust basically like I, I didn't have a bad experience I've been mm -hmm. traveling now for two years yeah and I've I don't feel like I've been scammed or like I mean of course you might have the one person or the other that overcharges you but then mm -hmm. so for yeah sure. trust for people sure. be spontaneous yeah okay I just wanted to say that for some can be a scam for you can cannot be even you know brush your shoulder or whatever so it, it doesn't it's it really uh, depends on the perspective and I wanted to ask do you always book airbnbs or do you like prefer hostels what is your uh, location that you go for since you're nomad and you need uh, like a stable internet connection what is your go-to um on the scam thing mm -hmm. I also think it's a mindset because I actually don't mind being scammed because then at least the money goes to a local person and I feel like I'm supporting them yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so then it's like yeah maybe it's five ten euros more than you'd normally pay but at least it's five ten euros for a local person mm -hmm. um what I normally book is initially I looked at airbnbs and booking.com but then I met some nomads who all book into co-livings and it's basically like for me it's so normal what is a co-living mm -hmm. but a lot of people are asking what is a co-living yeah. so basically it is like imagine a flat chair 
but with all adults, everyone's earning a good, decent income. Everyone's mm -hmm. working fully remote, and there is a community. So there, are, it like every co living is different, but most of the times they have some networking events. Um, they organize dinners together, things like that. Mm -hmm. And the advantage there is that people that book into co livings they want to do work, so it's not going to be like a party hostel. Exactly. And you can have privacy if you want. You can have your own room. Mm -hmm. But you also get the community, you automatically get friends because you'll bump into people in the kitchen, in the living room. Yep. And yep. I think for nomads, it's perfect. Mm. So it's basically networking for working professionals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. nice, nice. It's like a hostel for rich people with privacy. <laughs> Yes, you can put it that way. So it's a really interesting concept. Uh, do they have like also like a website, the whole community is like uh, on an app or something? Or do you, do you hear by word of mouth? How does it work? Both. So <laughs> I feel like I'm doing advertising for my friends. So in Macmillan, yeah. you basically have a list of all the co-livings uh -huh. and or like at least the ones where he has been to. And mm -hmm. then there are several websites like this. There is one I'm not sure how it's called, but it's like surf and work or something okay. where you can find co-livings where you can also surf nearby. Mm -hmm. um, and also if you just type in co-living plus whichever city you're going, I don't mm -hmm. know, Lisbon, Chiang Mai, whatever is popular, you yeah. will find a list of co-livings. Yeah. And yeah. worth of mouth. There are some famous ones. There is mm -hmm. one in France called Chateau, which I still want to try and check out, which is basically a castle. Yeah. So you work from a castle. Mm -hmm. um, the name is and, it's then, saying it. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. And then there are some that are known for the community. So, mm -hmm. for example, I really like all Chiang Mai. They're just opening a second branch there. Mm -hmm. And then one that has been highly recommended was Nine Co Living. So I haven't been there yet. It's mm -hmm. in Tenerife. Mm -hmm. So there are some where within the nomad community, yeah. you hear a lot. Yeah. They get the reputation and like, okay, I guess I have to go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that you have uh, finished uh, film school in Vienna. Uh, how those are related with the economics in business? Like, how did you make the connection between the two? <laughs> the University of Economics, I did while I was working full time as a shop assistant, mm -hmm. because that was the job where I felt like I was stuck for two, three years. Every day was the same. Mm -hmm. And I applied for some other jobs, but I just didn't get anything. And I wasn't mm -hmm. sure why. And I think it was because the job I did was a sales assistant. Mm -hmm. And well, if sales assistant is the wrong word, I was just standing behind the cashier. Okay, sure and mm -hmm. yes, and it was super boring. And a friend of mine, he was studying there and he said, oh, you can do it even if you have a full time job. Mm hmm. And you can't do it when you have a full-time job. <laughs> so I don't know how, why he thought it's possible. But I mean, you can, but it will take you so much longer because mm -hmm. you can't go to the lectures. You can't um, get an appointment for all the exams because you have to change your schedule for it and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I was there because I thought I could study next to a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And it's not really related. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then I guess... Mm, in hindsight it was good that I went there especially mm -hmm. film school because you learn about storytelling you learn about the hero's journey mm -hmm. and economics and business is very useful for anything did you stay uh, on like the full uh, program or just few semesters the whole year um, film school was supposed to be three semesters and it dropped mm -hmm. out after two mm -hmm. and I never thought I would be a dropout but I mm -hmm. was because okay. I just the way they handled the school and things that happened there were just not great. And I thought, even mm -hmm. if it's half a year, I'm just not going to do it. And University of Economics, it really depends how quickly you get done with your exams. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, more, how long it would take you if you would get the longest, uh, the fastest route. But I stayed there maybe two semesters. But I did like one or two exams mm -hmm. while I was there because of my full-time job. Mm -hmm. In the end of the day, you, you tried. It was not like uh, 
you didn't give it a go and it, it, sometimes it's really not for you when like whatever you sign up for you realize only if you try that something is not meant for you and that that's okay I think you learn a lot through these two experiences and uh, look at you now look at you now <laughs> <laughs> I mean I think well in hindsight film school was useful like even though I signed up to the editing um mm -hmm. part we also had this American acting teacher visiting for like a week and mm -hmm. our teachers were saying that if you want to be a good editor get in front of the camera because then this way you know how to give directions and you know what it's like to be an actor and mm -hmm. what you would need to hear mm -hmm. and even until today I think it's the most useful thing I've ever done and mm -hmm. acting has this bad rep but it is incredibly useful because it teaches you about empathy. It teaches you, you basically go through dialogues or monologues that you would have to act on mm -hmm. and write down what does the person actually think while they are saying this. Mm -hmm. So you learn a lot about that. And also it is kind of, you pretend to be a person you're not, mm -hmm. which I mean, is a bit fake, but mm -hmm. this massively helped me with my job interviews because mm -hmm. now when I go into a job interview, I enter it as the person that is going to get the job. Mm -hmm. So I don't like I go into it with a very different attitude. I don't mm -hmm. go in like, oh, I really need this or I really want this. I just go there like, I know I'm going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Because... Which doesn't always work. <laughs> but <laughs> True. Yeah. But in in freelancing, I think that's a really good distinction to have, like in your mind. Okay, I'm Nicoletta. That it's like the person that is at home, but Nicoletta that is at work is completely different human being, and she has like completely different priorities. So when you go on a discovery calls on or interviews, it's really important to put yourself as that. And having that switch, like you said, for the interviews, having the confidence, it really makes a difference. Maybe we all do a little bit of acting without even realizing it on this kind of yeah. Uh, situations but yeah it, it it's a very useful I bet um do, do you wish ever uh finishing it or in a different institution or in a different form like a film mm -hmm. school I think if they would have managed it well mm -hmm. I would have liked to have finished it but the problem was also we were supposed to have like 30 40 hours a week of mm -hmm teaching and learning and making our own films and then they would constantly cancel things last minute so we would mm. end up having five hours and most of the stuff I learned was from other students there which exactly. I'm incredibly grateful for because mm -hmm. otherwise I would have like spent a year there not learning anything mm -hmm. and so I think if I would have gone to a different film school and there are situations where you know when people ask oh what do you regret things like that mm -hmm. and all of it had to do with film school <laughs> like there was this internship that I I only got an invite to it mm -hmm. but it would have been for BAFTA you know BAFTA awards yes yes yeah so it was an internship for BAFTA six months where you edit interview like all these kind of different things mm -hmm. and I only just got an interview uh, sorry I only just got an internship at a different mm -hmm. company mm -hmm. and my ex-boyfriend who was this British guy mm -hmm. told me oh you don't want to risk going to that interview because what if your current company finds out and I was pretty young you know I was in my yeah. mid-20s so I just listened to him because I was like maybe English etiquette is very different here and mm. I only had two months left of saving so if I lose that internship I will have to leave the UK mm. so I regret not even have gone to that intern interview yeah to try. and I also got offered a camera gig which was part-time freelance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I was in my early 20s and my dad was like oh get a proper job it's not secure <laughs> which I disagree with now but back mm -hmm. then I was like I listened to my dad he knows about life he knows things better than me okay. um, which he does but yeah. I still wish I would have you done tried. it so mm -hmm. yeah so in a way it if the film school would have been different maybe I would have liked to finish it but also I'm very happy where I am now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now if uh, another opportunity related to film shows up would you take it this time in a heartbeat <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the opportunity yeah of course it depends but yeah. if it's related to film will you be like hmm maybe it's a uh, time to rethink <laughs> mm, well 
I now started my own podcast and I'm editing my own podcast. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because I'm editing myself and mm -hmm. the interview that I've already listened to. Yeah. It feels like, oh my God, you know. Um, <laughs> but if it would be someone else's thing I have to edit, like it yeah. depends on the project. It could mm -hmm. be really cool. It could be really fun. But also having to learn a new skill again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, not learning it, but like flesh it out, improve it, perfectionize it. Then... Mm -hmm. Mm, it depends on the project. Okay, let's leave it it's like that. To say. <laughs> Did you have any more internships related to design or advertising? How did you decide, like, when was the point, okay, now I'm going freelance, I'm not going to work for anybody else. When was that moment? I had internships for DDB in Austria, which mm -hmm. is like Adam and Eve DDB in the UK. I don't know if you're in the advertising field, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a known yeah. um Bread in that industry mm -hmm. so I used to write copy for McDonald's and T-Mobile Austria which mm -hmm. I loved so that was a great internship yeah. and then I also worked for a marketing agency where I did email design so that was actually mm -hmm. um, I also got into that by accident I applied mm -hmm. for copywriting gigs mm -hmm. and then they offered me an internship when we had like an exhibition with uni And then it, they introduced me on my first day to everyone as the new design intern. And I was like, oh. where? What? Me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was a bit like, oops. But it was a great introduction to design because with emails, there's only so much you can do. Mm -hmm. There's one column, two columns, image and text, and that's it. So you yeah. learn about layouts. You learn the basics. What was the other question? What other internships I had? And Yeah. And how did you decide, okay, I'm not going to work for other people. I'll start uh, doing it myself and freelance. I was in the startup in the UK mm -hmm. and I only just quit my job at my first permanent UX company mm -hmm. which was a real estate company and mm -hmm. we did a tablet based software for real estate agents and there was just no opportunity to grow, to grow. like mm -hmm. I already knew the software and it was just adding updates and it was a bit boring mm -hmm. but I loved the company the people were great and then someone just messaged me on LinkedIn they're looking for a UX designer it was mm -hmm. an AI based startup mm -hmm. and I got the gig and then after three months and it was it was super fun it was a small team but it was startup mm -hmm. and it was like it was a lot of fun everyone was super excited to see where the product is going and that was four or five years ago and it was AI and it was like oh my god this is what AI can do mm -hmm. and then the investors committed fraud and the CEO just yeah <laughs> the CEO just didn't know how to deal with it so oh he god. told everyone a different story and then he told people that They will lose their job. But then he also told me that my job is safe because I'm in the development team. Uh -huh. And if another company will buy us, they will buy the developers and the UX designers because we're mm -hmm. producing. Yeah. And it just felt weird because I was the most recent hire. And mm -hmm. I would then stay. And it was a very uncomfortable feeling going back to the office. And everyone felt so at unease. And it was it was just not nice yeah. and I remember I would wake up in the morning my alarm would ring and as soon as I realized I have to go to work mm -hmm. I have to be in this office mm -hmm. where everyone hates to be in mm -hmm. I just thought why am I doing this mm -hmm. and I've been thinking about freelancing for a while but it, I guess it's with everyone who does something they've not done before am I yeah. good enough imposter syndrome am I going to make enough money the mm -hmm. insecurity um, instability of freelancing mm -hmm. and all these kind of things where I was like oh, should I really do this but mm -hmm. I was so frustrated and I luckily had three four months of savings where I thought mm -hmm. I'll just do it if it doesn't work out I can always find a permanent job. Maybe even my previous company would take me back, yeah. the real estate one. So I do have options. Mm -hmm. And then I just applied for freelance gigs and I found one. Mm -hmm. that, um, there, the investors pulled out. So that was like <laughs> like two companies in one year. What's happening? <laughs> But <laughs> Is it me? Is it my luck? <laughs> yeah. I was like, is it me? <laughs> No, they had just joined for like maybe, yeah, it was also like two, three months when I was there. But no, it wasn't me. It was because one of the founders, he had a goal for himself to be, um, what was it? He wanted to have some internal goal. He didn't achieve it. And so mm -hmm. he told him, 
he, he told himself, if I can't achieve that goal, I'm gonna, I'm no longer be in that position. I see. And then the investors, they invested because of him. Mm. And so it was, it was unrelated to me, I hope. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was definitely an interesting year. It was yeah. the year before COVID. <laughs> really? That was the beautiful yeah. moment. Oh my God. It's so interesting. Like, I think uh, one of the other uh, interviews that I had uh, recently about freelancing with another designer, she said she always was doing uh, freelancing. So to her, it was natural. But most of people I talked about, about uh, that topic, they always say, I had it until here. I didn't want to do what I did. So I wanted a bit of more freedom, flexibility. And I was like, same, same. I was like uh, waking up, going to the job that I didn't like. I cried a couple of times. So I was like, okay, this is not worth it. I'm just going to give it a go as scary as it is. So I I see that we, we are kind of similar in terms of... Um, when is when is the time to start freelancing when when you probably think about it for more than two months then it's time to do something about it <laughs> would you yeah. agree but i think it's yeah I, I think it's like this with any big change in your life if mm -hmm. you move cities if you finally break up with that relationship or things like that it's because mm -hmm. you reach a point where you're just so frustrated mm -hmm. and i think that's also the thing that holds back too many people when it's not ideal, but it's mm -hmm. also not bad enough to finally take action and do something because there are a lot of jobs where people are like, mm, maybe I don't get acknowledged. Maybe I don't have the freedom. Maybe I only get so many days of holiday mm -hmm. or I don't get paid a certain amount, but this, this, that, mm -hmm. which is fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, it can always get worse, but also if you're comfortable, you're never going to do that thing that will get you where you mm. actually want to be exactly. and you just have to go through that situation of discomfort for a little mm. bit and then uh, on the other side of that is everything you ever wanted and more like yes if I would have told myself 10 years ago what I'm doing now yeah. where I would be the people I would have met the money I'm earning I would be like yeah yeah you're joking <laughs> <laughs> but it's possible it is, it is. We had a little break and after the break, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. And one of them is, what is the most common issue that you face as a digital nomad and how you overcome it usually? How do you plan for like unexpected things? Most important thing, I guess, is having access to the internet. And mm -hmm. sometimes no matter how much you do your research, the internet might still break down or people tell you this is a great place to go. And then there's a power cut or um, yeah, just no internet, no good co-working, et cetera. So mm -hmm. what I usually do is I always get a data SIM card. So in mm -hmm. worst case, I can hotspot myself. Mm -hmm. And so far, luckily, I didn't have crazy bad experiences mm -hmm. also because I do my research. But I would recommend anyone who wants to become a digital nomad to check where you're going. I mm -hmm. would highly recommend booking co-livings because their selling point is high quality internet mm -hmm. compared to if you book some hotel on booking.com or Airbnb. I think on average, Airbnb internet is better, especially if it's someone's home, mm -hmm. but hotels, it's hit and miss. You never know. Mm -hmm. And another tip I would give is to not just listen to other people's recommendations because everyone always goes to the same restaurants, to the same places, and you will get to eat that food and see those things anyway but to also just stroll and get lost go for a walk without your phone and yeah just travel and explore mm -hmm. because otherwise yeah you don't really get to know the place you end up in your I call it the white bubble mm -hmm. where I think it's incredibly mm, kind of bad or like bad is the wrong word but it feels icky mm -hmm. if you go to a place like Indonesia and then all the people you meet are other Europeans Australians just other people that have all the privileges that you do and the only people that are locals are the waiters and taxi drivers and mm -hmm. it's just I'm not coming here to meet like yes I want to meet like-minded people but I also want to get to know your culture mm -hmm. and I don't want to eat in a place where I have eggs benedict every day and smoked salmon when I'm in Asia you know give me mm -hmm. your rice soup and give me your whatever it is that's your local dish yeah. so I would highly recommend to do research really make sure that you can 
work from there mm -hmm. and yeah just go and explore mm -hmm. get lost <laughs> yes get lost get lost and probably be more spontaneous and don't script every single step of the way you're not on a vacation you are on a journey so basically yes maybe, maybe give it a go this time yeah it's always good to leave your phone at home as well strangers mm -hmm. are so kind people are always helping so yeah. and how that works uh when it comes to i know being in a foreign country how do you manage if you don't know the language and you don't have your phone it depends on where you go sometimes mm -hmm. If you don't go too far remote, people mm -hmm. usually speak English or enough to be able to communicate. And even if they can't, mm -hmm. you can point, you can, there's so much in body language where people mm -hmm. can guess what you mean. Mm -hmm. Or I I had people that would just walk me somewhere to make sure I have someone who can translate or mm -hmm. have someone who can help me out. If your phone dies, if you have no connection, even if you have your phone, you know, but maybe mm -hmm. you don't have data and can't use Google Translate. Mm -hmm. There is always a way around. And I think people keep forgetting that before technology, this is how people used to travel. There, mm -hmm. <laughs> like when my parents met, my dad told me there wasn't such a thing as booking.com where you see pictures of the hotels. You would just go there. You're in this sure. foreign country. You just go to the taxi drop-off hope that they hope that they don't scam you or rip you off yeah. and then you just go to a random street and walk to a place and it would just be a sign with free room mm. and we forget that it's yeah. okay to do that and yes it can be hit and miss mm -hmm. but we're so used to doing so much research and know exactly what to expect and what to get that mm -hmm. I think this part of traveling kind of gets lost mm -hmm. um yeah because I think does this answer the question <laughs> yeah, don't worry here in this channel we answer all questions and not not even <laughs> those that we, I ask so it's okay yeah. every, every okay. answer is welcome I was just thinking about what you said and it's quite interesting and I believe um it's true and I, I'm guilty of that as well I think whenever I travel with my mom or whenever I went to visit her she she's that type of traveler doing spontaneous things asking random people people random things and doing the things the old way and I'm like mom don't bother them let's check out on online we're gonna find out better ourselves because these are two different things right this is how it's supposed to be this is how it's now the norm and how it was now it's considered like oh you're talking to me and you're a stranger and you didn't send me email like what's happening <laughs> so these two uh, worlds are kind of a little bit separated and I think it all happened also because of the pandemic and the digitalization and everything and we really forget about that first connection that people had like seeing each other talking to each other not knowing each other not booking anything it's just like okay I see you you see me can you help me yes I can and it's really important to try this uh, skill from time to time and it's it's quite interesting that you mentioned that I will have that in mind for the next travel. <laughs> yeah, I think oh. especially, I mm -hmm. mean, because my mom is Thai and my dad is Austrian and kind of grew up between those two cultures. Yes. And in Austria, it would be like, why do you talk to a stranger, you know, whereas in Thailand, my mom, you would you just drop her off at up. Yeah, you drop her off at a random bus stop. She will make yeah. friends. She will exactly. talk to people, you know, <laughs> and she will... Like it's it's a gift that we just don't have. Like even mm -hmm. if there would be someone you could talk to, we take out our phones just we don't have to talk to people. Exactly. And imagine on all the stuff we miss out on. Like if you're traveling and you can just ask the person, what's your favorite restaurant in this area? Exactly. Someone like and it really it shows when you travel and then you're in this restaurant and it's like trip advisor everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's just people that look like you were the same clothes as you. Mm -hmm. And we're all like, that's not the point of traveling, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yes, maybe you get food poisoning. Hopefully you won't. It's not fun, <laughs> but <laughs> you might miss out on dishes. It's like in Thailand, everyone eats Pad Thai, mm -hmm. everyone eats Khao Soi, but people don't eat Tom Kha, which is like this very delicious coconut soup you know, like okay. people just don't know about it because mm -hmm. they don't ask or did you know and it's I feel like a lot gets, lot gets lost it's not like you won't have a good experience mm -hmm. but you'll just have the same 
experience like everyone else because exactly. everyone recommends the same yeah exactly you, based on popularity and uh, what is trending you're missing out on so many other authentic and i believe maybe things that are meant for you rather than just trying the other pad thai and everything that everybody else is uh, photographing on instagram so i totally agree with that i just wanted to ask also uh, do you have a favorite destination or place you are like oh my god i feel like home here i want to stay and because i think you love surfing you might say somewhere coastal but let's hear <laughs> Well, there's a lot of places I really like. And normally, of course, I'm biased, but mm -hmm. I like Thailand a lot mm -hmm. because it's also much easier when you speak the language a little bit. And Everywhere. I'm not speaking it perfectly, but I <laughs> yeah. speak enough to order food, ask where to go, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, the problem with Thailand is you cannot really surf here. I surfed in Phuket, but I think mm -hmm. that's pretty much it. Yeah. If anyone knows any surfing spots in Thailand, let me know. Get them in the comments. <laughs> the other, yes, <laughs> but the other place I really loved was Las Palmas, and I think mm. if you're scared of being a digital nomad, that's a very safe option because mm -hmm. it's Europe, so you know, kind of like I guess your listeners will be from Europe, mm -hmm. so you have healthcare protection, you know, kind of the culture. But mm -hmm. you can surf, you have mountains, you even have sand dunes there. So like landscape wise, you have everything. Wow. And there is this great community. It's called mm -hmm. um, Live It Up Las Palmas. So it's like mm -hmm. a Slack channel. If you Google that, you mm -hmm. find everything. Mm -hmm. And within days, you meet the same people again, because mm -hmm. everyone's um, in that community, which again, is a bubble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so much about breaking out of that bubble, but also it's a really good entrance into digital nomading. So mm -hmm. that place, I would say. And also, I just came back from Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And I love it so much because it takes all the boxes. It has the surfing as well. Exactly. And yeah, I'm actually thinking of making it a base, but let's see. <laughs> okay, that, that was a great answer. <laughs> we have a couple of <laughs> candidates on the list. Then a little bit about your habits and can you share some useful skills or habits related to digital nomading and what helped you maybe uh, in your career and travel as well? Something that you picked up along the way? I think the thing with habits is you don't re realize that you have that habit mm -hmm. until someone else points it out. Mm -hmm. My friends are telling me I'm planning too much. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe my habit is that before I go somewhere, I always Google mm -hmm. everything, not everything, but what are the things that you should be doing? What are the foods that you need to eat? But then one habit that I started is when I arrive, I ask the receptionist, mm -hmm. what's your favorite restaurant? Mm -hmm. Or what's the dish that I should try? Mm -hmm. And then you can always see them lighten up and things like that. And yeah. so that's a habit that I started. But it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a local receptionist. You can also ask a person that has lived there, even someone that just joined. Mm -hmm. Everyone will have a place like, even if they say, I've not eaten here yet, you start yeah. a conversation. Yeah. And also, I think it's more about the people you meet anyway, mm -hmm. rather than the food you ate or what places places you've seen yeah yeah it's it's mainly about the people so yeah so the habit is maybe making friends <laughs> mm -hmm. okay so that will be also the skill that helped you in uh, work making friends oh, I think with work it's tricky yeah. to call people friends yeah. because as soon as the project ends you're mm -hmm. not always in contact mm -hmm. I think a useful it's not really a habit it's mm -hmm. something that I actively have to remind myself. Yeah. One useful thing I recommend everyone is that every couple of months, you just mm -hmm. message them. Mm -hmm. And it could be, let's say my previous boss, she I knew that she bought an apartment and she just moved in when the mm -hmm. contract ended. Well, boss, client, previous client. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I just asked her, hey, how's it going? How's the things with the, how are things with the house? Mm -hmm. Is the kitchen done yet? And yeah. then you just remind them, hey, you exist. Maybe they need another um support with UX mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's not really a habit that's something that I learned to do mm -hmm. mm. checking in yeah mm -hmm. do you do also that with your friends how do you manage your social connections because you work you travel you plan you are moving yes. every two months 
uh, you have social media, you have a podcast. Uh, how do you keep up with your social life? This is not in the list of questions. <laughs> <laughs> It is super tricky. I really need to get better at this because sometimes I reply to my friends very quickly mm -hmm. and mostly that's the friends that I'm in the same city with because you mm -hmm. kind of need to plan, you know. Yeah. But then friends that are in the UK or friends mm -hmm. that are still in Austria, mm -hmm. I check in with them maybe when I go back to the UK or when I go mm -hmm. back to Austria mm -hmm. or on their birthdays. And mm -hmm. I actually put myself a reminder now to yeah. with a list of friends Mm -hmm. that I like I have to just list Get with all to... my friends and all the people that I met traveling that because the thing is in every place you meet maybe four or five people that you kind of become close with mm -hmm. and then you go to another place and mm -hmm. I mean people would argue that those aren't really friends if mm -hmm. they're not near but I guess it's something that you will understand as a digital nomad that even if you don't see each other for a year mm -hmm. and then you meet again you're like nothing has changed you know yeah, yeah. and you, you still trust the person you still have these great conversations mm -hmm. and yeah so I managed that by setting myself a reminder to just reach out to them mm -hmm. and I sometimes take forever to reply to people um with what's the messages and stuff mm -hmm, so yeah mm -hmm. Oh, oh my god, I had another question and I forgot about it. Anyway, maybe for your podcast when we see each other next time. I wanted yes. to talk about the pausing friendships and when when you get back to the country or when something happens and you rekindle that relationship. And I think it's completely normal, quite normal to just stop a friendship while you're not there and then message them whenever you want to get back in touch. And I think people are quite flexible with that and they don't get it as a bad thing so i think it's fine whenever you are like have time yeah. to catch up with people that are around you so it is fine yes but also if you know when a friend doesn't reply for two three weeks also sometimes you feel like did i say something did i do mm. something you know and i don't like leaving people with that feeling mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. but it also is an effort from both sides exactly so, exactly yeah. it, it takes two to dance Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe uh, now you can give us your business card and tell us where people can find you. I will leave your handle of our Instagram and uh, where people can find you and what do you do as a wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, people can find me on Instagram. It's at Elizabeth Maya. And I also have a YouTube channel, which <laughs> I don't really promote, but maybe I should start. I just repost my reels there. So it's not crazy i have a newsletter mm -hmm. i have a podcast called the freelance blueprint where i interview other freelancers from all mm -hmm. over the world mm -hmm. and um yeah and i also just launched my new website called the freelance slash um, the freelance dash blueprint.com mm -hmm. and yeah okay great uh, oh yeah what do i do i'm a freelance ux designer <laughs> <laughs> yeah and yeah. i um coach people who want to go freelance Thank you, Elizabeth, so much for uh, taking the time and coming to the podcast. I can't wait to edit this episode because it was so chaotic and fun. Uh, I hope you have an amazing rest of the afternoon and can't wait to hear how is Tokyo and Japan for you. Um, and yeah, also can't wait to talk to you on the Work in Progress podcast, the podcast that I have with Kat. And guys, if you like this episode, make sure to like, subscribe and share with a friend. And also make sure to follow Elizabeth and see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you so much and speak to you in the podcast. Yay. <laughs>